welcome to Ken. All right, so welcome to a special event. We've got our Arctic uh, field cohort here with us, some alumni and researchers, and we're going to take a chance to talk about what's been going on in the classroom, how it's been so far, and reflecting on the experience of your Polar Trek expedition. So welcome back finally to all of the Arctic expeditions. I know it seems late in the season, but we've got everybody back safe and sound now. I'm going to start moving the slides along. So if you're not seeing the slides change, let us know in the chat box. But you should be seeing a, 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 a If someone joins the phone, mute your All right. Did someone join by phone? Yeah, I did. This is Andre. Hey, Andre. That's perfect. Thanks. Cool. All right. So you should be able to see a screen right now that looks like the screen you've got in front of you. So on the top left is our video panel. Folks have been uh, checking that out. You're welcome to use that if you want when you are talking through the webinar. Um, of course, for the talk button, you hit it once, start speaking, and then press it again when you're done. We've got our participant panel. If you've got a question sometime, go ahead and raise your hand there, and we'll let people out help us know. And then feel free to use the chat box at any time. And if there are other folks joined by phone, go ahead and um, mute your phone in the meantime as well with star six or mute uh, so we don't hear dogs barking in the background, that kind of thing. So. I'll try and move through our introduction slides pretty quick here, so we try and keep our webinar nice and short. I know it's evening for just about all of us already. So if what we'll do is um, if there's oh, we talked about the questions and discussions, so I mentioned that already. And our agenda for the evening, just an update on where we're at, how many teachers have been going out, a reflection on the experience from our teachers who sent in slides. And then researchers that are associated with those projects will give you a second to um, chime in and let us know what you were thinking about the experience and how to move forward with the teachers. And then we'll talk a little bit about resources, remind folks of what ARCIS can offer um, and how to stay connected. And then just a few other announcements and then we'll adjourn. So a lot of this will be um, hearing from our teachers and our team. Just a quick look at where we've been so far. So we've got a lot of teachers that have headed out to the field. Um, I am thinking it's about 136 when I was doing the math this morning. And so lots in the Arctic. And thanks to being able to cost share with research teams, that kind of thing makes that possible. And then I'll talk a little bit about our Antarctic teachers that are right now in the field or heading out for this year. So lots of folks participating, and we've got our, our current cohort down there at the bottom. And I'll mention at the end a little bit about what we're doing for the future of Polar Trek. Um, I know a lot of people are curious. As a reminder of uh, some of the accomplishments of the program, we've got over 100 Polar-related lessons developed um, in the learning resources, so share those widely with folks that might be interested. Over 50,000 participants connect to polar regions through the Polar Connect events that you all held while you were in the field. Just this morning, we had our Antarctic a Day webinar with Alex Eilers. She is down at McMurdo. And there were 3,400 people registered for her event. So I, I don't know, Janet was keeping track of the number of people online. There was probably at least 40 folks kind of in that participant list with classrooms behind them. So it was a big event. 82 of those, 82 percent of those people participate for the first time. So it's new people learning more and more about the polar regions. There's a little information there about the website, so always be directing folks back to us and uh, let us know if there's partners that you can think of that we should be uh, working with in the future. So I am going to turn it over pretty quick to our teachers to give us an idea of sort of a rundown of what they were doing in the field and then what's going on in the classroom updates on their lessons that might be coming out, or highlights and challenges, surprises, things that they'd like to share about sort of what it's looked like since they've come back from the field, and hopefully some ideas of what the future plans are for collaborating. So each of the teachers put together a slide or two that talks a little bit about um, what they've been up to. And here's just a quick look at the teachers, our flyer that has gone out of all the Arctic teachers we supported this year. 
and a couple of cute pictures of all of you back at orientation. It was nearly a year ago that we all got together and had that chance to learn a bit more about the program and get ready to head out. And I would say that this Arctic uh, cohort really utilized all the skills that were given at, um, at the orientation. So thanks for that. At this moment, I'll just take a quick pause and see if anybody needs anything, any questions so far. All right, I think I just saw that Rose joined us. Thanks for coming. Um, and we're going to get started. We'll probably turn it over to Emily first. It looks like her slides were added in here. And my apologies for the slides being sort of shrunken a little bit here. It's uh, something with Blackboard Collaborate lately. So we've got some tiny slides, but they're all right. So Emily, I will turn the microphone over to you. And you are welcome to use your video if you want to share that. Okay, can everyone hear me? Uh, yep. Okay, so my project was about um, climate change and pollinators in the Arctic. I was in Kangaroosak, Greenland um, during the month of June. Um, I traveled there with the National Guard in the C-130, which was a fun experience. I got stuck in Canada for a night, and we spent the night in a military barracks, which was a first for me. Um, the next morning we flew out and we made it to Kangalusa, Greenland. And there's two places we stayed while we were there. The first is the um, KISS, which is the Kangalusa International Science Station. And that is the picture, the middle picture of that red white building. And all the buildings kind of look that way. They're all just different colors. And then the picture next to it was where I spent most of my time in that little tent. So that's where we spent most of our night. Um, some pictures underneath that were just getting our gear ready. We had to take several truckloads out and carry our water and everything. Um, another thing, when we got there, the water was contaminated. So we also had to boil all our water. Um, our project is that we were looking at flowers and how climate change is affecting the pollination of these flowers. So the first thing we did when we started out is we found three or nine locations. Three locations near the um, ice, which were the cold regions. Three near kind of middle ground and then three in Kangaroosak, which was our warm ground. And the purpose of that was to show the gradient temperature gradient and how the climate is shifting from cold to warm and the effect it has on the plants and the pollinators. So those colorful little circle things are um, called eye buttons and they record temperature. Christine, the researcher, had this USB thing that she kind of put them in and it was able to record the temperature. I think it recorded it like every hour and um, we made them bright colors so we could find them again. After we found our nine locations, we had to record vegetation, wind speed, everything like that, which is the next picture. And then we did three treatments at each site. So we had 27 total sites because we had three types of flowers we were looking at. And then each one had three cold, three warm and three medium. So 27 sites, and at each site we bagged 45, or we treated 45 flowers. Um, 15 of them we bagged so that no pollinators could reach it. 15 of them we hand pollinated in the bags so only the pollination that we provided would um, affect the flower. And then 15 we just tagged but we left open so we could see how the actual pollinators were doing. And we came back to each site three times, and while we were there, we would hand pollinate again and observe pollinators for about 10 minutes. We'd just sit there and have little microphones and spoke every time a pollinator came. And another way we caught pollinators is in the bottom right-hand corner is some basically glue, and we just put glue on the flower and caught them. 
but those were untreated flowers. So that was just kind of a side thing. Um, and then I left, but Christine, when she, before she left back in uh, August, she collected the seeds from all the flowers we treated, and now she's taking them back to the lab, and she's going to cut them open and count the number of seeds and see if there's a difference. And when I look left, it appears that the flowers closer to town, which were our warm sites, were bigger and had more flowers. So just from a visual observation, it looks like the warming temperatures are causing more pollinators or better pollination of the flowers and making them bigger and healthier. And then a side research project, and we, we caught some bees and um, Christine froze them and was going to take them back and dissect them. I caught a bee to take to a bee conference, which I'll talk about in a minute. But these bees were huge. They were like half the size of my thumb. So that was about that. Does anyone have any questions about that slide? Um, the next slide is about my outreach in classroom. Um, I partnered with a local bookstore. It's called Joseph Best Bookstore. And I did a lot of stuff with them. Before I left, I kind of gave an informational talk to adults and kids. I had some demonstrations that I used from the book, like the blubber hands. And um, there, I think there was one there about insulation. So I used different fabrics about insulation. So I took several little examples out of the book and used them. And I had that talk for about two hours. And when I got back, I actually, my mom's a reading teacher, so she helped me write a book about my time in Greenland. And that's the, the top row of pictures, the middle one, you see me holding a book. That's the book I wrote. Um, and then I read it to kids. It was kids' story time. So I read the book I wrote, and then I had some kids' activities and kind of hands-on. The picture below it showed, letting me show them the bee, and I handed out some coloring sheets, and I demonstrated, I had a bee puppet, and I demonstrated how a bee pollinates a flower with cotton balls, whereas my pollen grains. So I was dealing with kids that were probably anywhere from 2 to 10, and they were pretty... They're interested there. It's very cool. Um, and then also the same bookstore, they have a coffee shop, and they named a coffee drink after my expedition. It's called the Honey Bee. While I was in Greenland, and they advertised it with my name and the um, travels I was going on. And they also put a, a coffee sleeve, which is kind of on the bottom, with a QR code that I made for that attached to the um, my journal. So that's what Joseph Best did. Um, I also partnered with a local coffee shop called Coffee Time. And they, I stood up front of their shop, that's the bottom left-hand corner, and presented to people who came in. And I had information about the Arctic and research. And I had the cold weather kit, but it was like probably 98 degrees out, so not many people wanted to try on the jacket. But they still enjoyed looking and feeling how heavy the boots were. And I stood out there and talked to them, and they wrote some stuff up about me on their Facebook page and their web page. And they also, they call it Coffee Ambassadors. And if you're traveling, they'll give you a pound of coffee in exchange for you taking pictures and sending it to you of drinking the coffee in different locations. So I got some pictures of me drinking it at Kiss, um, on the ice. So that was that. I'm trying to think what else is. I made a lot of tools. I made pins, business cards, coffee sleeves. I made a little stamp and made posters. Um, I passed them out for about a couple of weeks before I left. Um, while I was there, I did a polar field call. We had a middle school science conference, which I was part of setting up. And so it was easy to work it in where I called in. And we stayed, and I think we had about um, 30, I think 30 or 20 um, teachers there. 
that were middle school teachers in my region. So they stayed and listened. Um, when I got back, I had a TV interview, which was about 30 minutes. There's a link there. I also had an article written up on me, which is the next link. And then I'm going to be a presenter at a B conference in spring 2015, which I'm hoping maybe Christina can join. Christine can join me because I really don't know much about bees. I know about what we did, but hopefully she can join. Um, before I left, I had an artist day in my classroom, and I had kids make postcards what they thought the artist looked like, and. I used one to give some of those little demos in the um, book we got, the same ones that I used at Joseph Fest. And I had the cold weather kid, and I let him try it on, and I showed some YouTube videos about the artist and um, kangaroo sack, and I showed some clips of, there's a video called Vanishing of the Bees, and told them what I was going to be doing, and gave them business cards so they could follow along. And then with the postcards, I actually took them to Greenland with me and mailed them back to the students with authentic Greenlandic stamps, which is what the top left-hand corner is. And then this year, so far, we finished our ecology unit, and I actually kind of allowed the students to mimic my research. It obviously wasn't in the Arctic, but we had some flowers. I had to keep them from mowing them down, but um, we went out there. I explained what I did and how it relates to ecology and interdependence and what's needed to survive. And I had the students hand pollinate and observe pollinators and come up with the conclusions of how this affects flowers. And they're sixth graders, so still starting a little basic. Um, the next unit I'm on is the weather unit. And I haven't really got to it yet, but I'm going to talk about wind and air currents and how warm and air, cold air gets carried around. and um, and also the ozone. So I'm starting to talk about that and how it affects us compared to the Arctic because I want to compare um, different regions. And I'm still coming up with ideas to use in the future. So I guess that's all. Thanks, Emily. That was great. Um, I will definitely say she probably had the most text on her slides, so lots to say. But folks can definitely keep it shorter if they want to, but that was a good bit of information. Thanks, Emily. If you turn off your um, talk button and video, perfect, thanks. I'm going to jump to uh, the next slide here, which is Tina's. She headed to Greenland with Jason Briner, who is available online. And I'll let Jason explain the research a little bit in a second. I would say that, and, and Tina sends her regards. She has some family things to attend to this evening, so um, she really wishes she could have made it. So just quickly, I'll mention a few things that uh, really set uh, Tina's expedition apart. She was in a, one of our first remote teachers, just like um, Emily was, but she had really mastered that uh, satellite phone um, out in the field, which is a pretty a uh, big task for anybody who was preparing for that while they were at orientation. And um, a thing that she has mentioned a few times that was a really, really crucial piece was being able to visit the field team and, and some of the research team ahead of time. So they met up in, I believe it was in New York, and Jason can correct me, but um, getting that chance to get to know the team ahead was a great opportunity. And I will mention at the end of uh, our webinar that folks can certainly apply for funds to visit their research teams after. So I will just say that for Tina, and then I think I'll turn it over to um, to Jason, if he wants to add anything about what working with Tina was like and any ideas for the future. Look, can you hear me? I've turned talk and video on here. It's perfect. All right, good. Um, yeah, it's too bad that Tina couldn't join uh, primarily because I don't I'm not totally up to date on what she's the latest is uh, what she's been doing in her classroom and for outreach, but um, I can comment on my experience uh, having Tina in the field and and in the working with Polar Trek uh, teacher. Um, so Tina, you're you were correct. Tina visited um, my group here in Buffalo. She was able to do so because we hosted one of the um, Arctic field safety training courses. So she came out for that, uh, and at the same time, 
got a chance to stay with me and get to know me and, and also um, talk to a lot of the students in my research group and get a feel for the kind of research that we do, um, which is usually very remote. And as all you teachers and researchers here know that when you're spending uh, time with uh, people um, in a remote location, it's, you end up being a little family. And so having some familiarity with each other goes a long way, actually. And uh, I was also able to visit her school and give a talk to her um, uh, middle school class. She's an eighth grade uh, earth science teacher, uh, one of two in, at her school, which is in Ipswich, Massachusetts. And so I visited her school ahead of time also. Um, we had an outstanding time in the field together. Um, we also flew um, through Kangalusuak, Greenland, um, but then got um, went to a couple of different communities and ended up getting helicoptered out into some remote areas in uh, Western Greenland. And our research was involving um, to try to understand the history of ice caps independent from the main Greenland ice sheet. We were using a variety of geological techniques to reconstruct how big or small these ice caps were in the past. And so Tina got experience not only just camping remotely and using that snap phone, but um, uh, she got experience collecting mud from lakes um, to look at the sediment cores, which she had experience with a little bit in the past working with um, Julie Brigham Bretty's group. So that was cool for her to get to, get to see that, how that happens in the field for her. Um, and then a variety of other sampling. We were doing rock sampling and, and fossil vegetation sampling to try to, the tools we're using to try to reconstruct the ice cap history. Um, she was very active at blogging the whole time, so she was able to put that sap phone to good use. Um, she had a laptop computer, and um, every day she spent a couple of hours um, responding to her students uh, on her blog posts who were, who were posting questions on her daily blog, or mostly daily blog, and, and she was taking the time to respond to every single one of them um, they had great questions. It was, uh, uh, from my point of view, it was one of the big successes of the field season is getting her students engaged in uh, what she was doing on a daily basis. So that was really fun to, to be in the field with Tina and obviously to see her enthusiasm um, and excitement towards the research and then to basically live share that with her students back home. So that was really great. Um, yeah, so I guess Wrapping up then, like I say, um, like I said, so she has been, I think she's known in her community um, of coastal Massachusetts. She's also been in touch with people in um, communities where she's from in the Adirondack Mountains. And so I know that there's um, the communities in those two um, that regions are aware of her research. And I think she's interacting with the communities at some level to do community uh, outreach. Um, obviously, there's um, the impression she's making on her uh, eighth graders, not only her outgoing eighth graders from last year, which were well aware of her plans to go to Greenland last summer, um, but also her uh, what were seventh graders that her that's her incoming eighth grade class, and they're benefiting from um, some lessons and some insights about um, you know glacier change in the Arctic from from her experience. Um, it's a good idea to. Um, for us to get together this year, we plan to do that. I also have a, a PhD student who was heavily involved in the research and um, who lived in southern New Hampshire for some time and she went to school there. And so she, it's very close to Ipswich and she goes back there often. So there's also um, plans in place for her to go visit that classroom uh, as our results start falling into place and she'll be able to go, you know, have stuff to say there. So I think I'll leave it at that unless there are questions. Perfect. Thanks. Um, all right. I'm going to turn it over to Peggy and just give us a brief synopsis of what you were doing up in Norway and then what you've been doing since. And then we'll turn it over to Julie. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. Perfect. Okay. So um, there's my slides. And I have to say this is like the most amazing experience I've ever had. So thank you, Janet and Sarah and everybody at Polar Track and 
Robbie and Julie and Ross Powell, who were the principal investigators on the um, on the expedition. So mine was a little bit unique um, because it was a research experience for undergraduates, and we had six undergraduate students with us from um, different universities. And so, as you might guess, hanging out with six college kids is a total blast, and um, that is what we had. And each of them got to pick one aspect of the research to um, be their own and to ultimately collect all the data and turn it into a senior um, thesis. And so we were researching uh, the glaciers in Svalbard, um, Norway, in a science station uh, called Nielsen. And um, every day we went out in three little boats, like you see in the upper left-hand corner, and um, took the students out, and they had the opportunity to collect their data. We did that for 12 days straight. We were out in the water all day, every single day. So um, some of the things that the students were investigating was the sedimentation rate. In fact, in the picture in the upper left, um, Steve is pulling in one of his sediment traps. He also did some core samples. One student did the symmetry, another oceanography with a CTD and um, getting the aspects of the water column. One a student was looking at biology and phytoplankton. Um, another was looking at isotopes in the um, sediment deposits. So um, every day when we were out there, it was just like a fireworks show going on with the glacier constantly calving. That's the picture you see middle left, um, which was an amazing thing to witness. Um, the water in front of the glacier was sometimes very ice choked, like you see at the bottom right. Um, and sometimes it was clear. And so it was a different um, experience almost every day. But it was quite an experience for me to try and uh, maneuver my little boat through all of that ice at times. Um, we did, the group saw um, polar bear on two separate occasions. The first was right in the um, science station between the dorms. And um, we got that picture. You can see that one is collared. And then uh, he left some neat prints. Actually, she, I think it was a female, left some neat prints um, there next to my hand. The other time that we saw the polar bear was actually out in a boat. It was on um, an ice chunk. And then after it was spotted, dove into the water. And we didn't know where it was. So that was a little bit of a tense experience that we all came out of OK. We were all rifle trained. You can see me down there in the bottom. Um, and so when we got the call, radio call from Julie that the polar bear had been spotted, we all loaded and were on guard and um, made our way out of there so that polar bear could do its polar bear thing. So um, just great, great, great experience. And if you want to forward the slide, we'll be on to my next one. There we go. Thank you. So um, top left is um, the glacier that we were looking at with um, three mountain peaks in the background. It was just, it was, the scenery was just, I can't even describe it, just totally awe-inspiring. On the right, um, a huge iceberg. Um, there were a lot of little ice chunks, but we passed daily just some enormous um, icebergs and um, watch them calve as well. And on one of the last days, just the hugest one ever came off, and that was really phenomenal. Um, okay, so some of the um, outreach that I've been doing beforehand, um, I visited a lot of classrooms um, along with my own um, and Girl Scout groups and other groups and did activities. Um, bottom left I, is with the Girl Scouts. We're actually doing blubber gloves. But um, middle bottom, um, the, the one that I did the most was actually um, a core sample activity. And you see uh, to the right, he's got a bunch of Petri dishes stacked up. And they had little beads in them that represented diatoms so that they could get the idea when we brought up a core sample and look at what's in it, we can kind of tell what past climate was like or um, what the deposition there was like. Um, bottom right, um, Julie and Ross did a Skype session with my students. And um, that was really interesting and got them connected even more um, so that they were able to follow along with me as I went. Um, since I've come back, I um, 
some of you might remember, I moved to Michigan where I'm doing a PhD program in um, science education and I'm also teaching an undergraduate class in weather and climate. So um, I have spoken with them and created some lessons um, on glacier dynamics that we've done together and then spoken to some of the other undergraduate classes about my experience. And then also um, in the process of putting in a research proposal on um, implementation of climate change education. And so all of these experiences will continue to dovetail and fit nicely into that. And uh, are there any questions? That was great, Peggy. Thanks so much. And good luck with the PhD as you're moving along. Uh, you've got a lot of work ahead of you, but you're doing a great job. We know that, that's for sure. Uh, Rose is asking, uh, where in Michigan? Okay, um, in Kalamazoo, I'm at Western Michigan uh, University. All right, I will turn it over to uh, Julie if you'd like to comment on, uh, sorry, to, yeah, to Julie, I'm looking at Peggy's name on here, and she can comment. Yeah, okay, um, I have the talk on, so I, I guess you guys can hear me fine? Okay, great. Yep. Well, um, just, you know, congratulations, Peggy. We had such a wonderful time um, last summer, and it's just been really wonderful. Um, I know uh, Rosh couldn't be here this evening, but um, anyway, we both were so amazed at how much you were able to do and all the creative uh, videos and stuff that you did. Um, if you haven't had a chance, the others, uh, if you haven't had a chance to look at some of her, her blogs, the science videos and so on that she created were just really just um, awesome. And um, it's just been fabulous and, and uh, you know, since we got back, people still looking at these videos and, and having a lot of fun with them. So it was, you know, really great. Um, you know, Ross and I are working with the students now to keep them motivated to work on their senior thesis. And um, it's just, I think it was just a, such a, it's such a wonderful opportunity for the students to think about how to communicate what they're doing, even though they're, you know, um, 20, 22 years old, how do they communicate that to people who are 12 years old? And to think about how to, how to do that. And so it's just a, a wonderful kind of mentoring uh, staircase of, from us to the, to the students and Peggy, and then also down to the, middle school level. So it, it was just a wonderful experience and thanks so much. I'm really, uh, we'll, we'll be keeping in touch with Peggy. So any questions? Thanks. Great. All right. Our next slide is from uh, Cyan. So I'll let you talk for a few minutes about what you've been up to lately. And then I believe we have Kathleen online as well. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, I was up in great. Barrow, Alaska for four weeks from July 14th to August 9th. And I was working with Dr. Ann Garland and Dr. Kathleen Fisher. And our project was called uh, Hermes, Historical Ecology for Risk Management, Youth Sustainability. And um, it was really awesome going up to Barrow. I had no idea what it was going to be like. And um, while there, we uh, a big part of our project was looking at the current infrastructure that Barrow had along the coastline to fight storm surges and kind of what areas of the community were um, most at risk for um, changes with coastal erosion. And to also meet and work with the local community, both the local community and the emergency manager um, from Barrow. And to set up a long-term, well, I guess you'd say coastal monitoring program that was uh, kind of joint between the community and with the government um, of Barrow and the emergency management department. 
And one of the fun things that I did was I created 21 videos using um, the iPad, learning how to video blog with the iPad, making these short little educational nuggets, I called them, about just a lot of the things that I was learning, especially with Kathleen being there, being an oceanographer, but also um, things that were pretty interesting just in the community of Barrow. And um, so those two pictures are screenshots of the videos that I was able to put together that I put on the blog, but also um, I was able to put on my Facebook and YouTube, and, and I've been using those in my class to show students some of the things that I was doing um, when I did my lessons on climate change and coastal processes. And so since I've been back, one of the things that was kind of different and unique about the project is that um, it, the areas uh, who Kathleen and Anne work for, the foundation, was able to support a remote student of mine. So she got to follow along from Phoenix and to learn about coastal erosion processes. And she actually created a fantastic poster that she's going to be able to present with me in January at a local um, uh, technology teaching conference called Tech Talks. And um, and and the like I said, the poster came out fantastic. So it was really interesting to have a college community college student following along with the project and also learning as we went through this process. Um, and besides that, I've been, since I've been home, besides sharing with my students, I was also able to do a uh, a talk on my campus where I talked about Barrow and everything that I did, but also um, teaching the other colleagues how to video blog with the iPad. And they thought that was pretty fantastic. So that's pretty much my summary. Perfect. Yeah, that's great, Diane. Thank you. Um, and I'll turn it over to Kathleen. So say and you can press the talk button, and then Kathleen will be able to chat with us. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me, and I've turned down the video as well. As well. Um, so Sarah, can you hear me? Sounds great. OK, wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, it was wonderful having Sarah uh, and having um, Cyan with us up in Barrow. Uh, that we were a small research group, and what, uh, this was the beginning of our uh, a long-term project uh, in focused around the city of Barrow. So uh, Cyan was a wonderful help to us in a series of meetings that we had with um, other scientists who were researching in the area on coastal erosion, uh, the government uh, officials who are involved in coastal erosion long-term planning, and um, community members who uh, are becoming aware and wishing to get involved in uh, monitoring their coastline. Uh, Cyan as a teacher and also as a geomorphologist was a great help to us in I assessing uh, some of the critical sites that we looked at that were important to the community as far as potential threats to um, infrastructure and to people uh, by helping to identify the processes that were ongoing at those sites and the uh, the uh, risk that they posed to um, the community at large. Additionally, we did have some community events which were really great involving families, you know, um, young, old, single people, uh, you know, married people with two children, whatever. And it was wonderful to have Cyan there as well as another student who was with us, a graduate student to give presentations and to talk to community members. So all in all, it was a very positive experience. It was a good beginning and that we hope to build on in future years. And we really appreciate the contribution Cyan made. And um, additionally, she, uh, she mentioned the community college student working with us. Uh, um, You might have hit okay. the talk button, Kathleen. 
Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I had my pointer on it, and I noticed my computer went out. Just so. the last four seconds. But I just mentioned about the poster developed by the community college student who worked with us remotely. It's a great documentation of um, the issues that we looked at in this first year and what we some it gives some indication of the direction we hope to go in in future years. And that poster will be um, put online on our website. Uh, um, Fairly soon, actually, it's it's pretty well completed. So it was just a wonderful experience. Uh, we're big fans of Polar Trek. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. That was great. Um, so our next person is going to be Regina. So Kathleen's all set. Great. We'll turn it over to Regina. Just a little explanation of what you were doing and most what you've been up to since. Okay, hi. Are there any slides, Sarah? Do the pictures go through? There we go. Okay, thanks. Um, I was at Tulip Field Station in the Elastic, Alaskan Arctic Tundra this summer with uh, Rose Corey and George Kling from the University of Michigan. And uh, what was really nice about this project is that uh, Rose and George collaborate with Byron Crump, uh, um, who's from Oregon State, Corvallis, um, who also sponsors the Polar Trek teacher, Lauren Littell, who and they will be up probably next talking about their project. But it was really interesting for me to see two projects working together and to, to see how scientists collaborate. And for me, that was this part of seeing science in action was one of the biggest benefits for me as a science teacher. Um, and one of the things I bring back, uh, Rose and George have done uh, a continuing project looking at the Alaskan watershed and sampling water all along the uh, watershed from the start to the mouth of the river and looking at uh, microbes and then CO2 release. And a huge shout out to Rose because her work is uh, literally groundbreaking and was published in Science uh, right after the expedition got back. So congratulations on that, Rose. Um, but but, that, but that, that's the point, to, to be able to see world-class science in action and, and what it takes um, to get to, to produce that type of, of uh, research. That, that really was one of the benefits. So um, I think I'll talk more about um, coming back instead of what we did in the field. That was great, but, but you guys can see that already. Um, those lessons of, of what it's like to, to do real science um, are some of the things that I'm bringing back, and I, I've been able to talk with people from our staff, uh, do a lot of community presentations, and then bring Polar Trek into the classroom. And just from having been in the Arctic gets people's attention, they're very interested, and they want to see what's going on and hear about the experience. Um, so to, to the staff, and I did uh, two different staff presentations, I really encourage them to use polar science lessons uh, in, their, in their study units and have teachers bring on, uh, do the ice core samples and, and look at other lessons. And, and they're getting it. They're kind of understanding uh, how polar science relates to a bigger picture and bigger um, topics in science. And I, and I think that's one thing people don't know. And one thing that we as Polar Trek teachers can bring and add is what does polar science mean? Because I think people just don't realize that. So, so that's kind of what my, part of my mission now that I'm back here to, to explain what polar science is. Um, as a science teacher then, I can see what students need to do to be able to get into the classroom, to be able to do good work. And, and that's one of the things I share with the teachers. Um, and some of the things I've observed from being in the field is that students really need to keep an excellent notebook and to be really precise in what they're doing. Um, and teachers were surprised to see the picture of the handwritten notes that uh, are so so uh, carefully kept uh, by Rose and her team. Um, students need to be able to be flexible. Um, and, and I show that geologists were looking at DNA samples of bacteria. And they might not have studied that, but that's what they're doing in the field. And, and those, I think, are important lessons for all teachers to understand that as we're, we're training students um, to teach them what field work looks like. 
Um, so that really was a huge part of the experience. And I thank Rose and George and all of the, the extended team for um, inviting me into the lab and, and, and letting us do so much and see so much of, of what you're going, what you're doing that, that really uh, influence, uh, influences the teaching now. Um, so the, the lessons apply in the science classroom, of course, as we talk about climate change. As we're looking at history of Earth, um, looking at uh, ice core samples, the picture that's, that's up on the screen is from a Girl Scout event I did a couple of weeks ago. There was a career uh, STEM day for Girl Scouts in the San Francisco Bay Area. And there were 20, 20, or 12, excuse me, 1,200 uh, registered participants. So there were a lot of excited young ladies going around. Um, and look, they, they really caught their attention to look at the ice core samples um, and to try on the, the clothes and the blubber hands and those things. But, but it, it's just so different. It really worked well. Um, so, I, <clears throat> excuse me, talk about history of Earth using polar lessons, talk about climate change. But uh, with chemistry, it was really interesting to see, to be able to explain chemistry lessons, <clears throat> excuse me again, and bonding um, in terms of the field work. And, and that's the lesson I'm working on with Rose and trying different uh, strategies of how to make a game out of teaching chemical bonding and how that's influenced by sunlight. So I'm working on that, Rose, and trying to get the best lesson out there for you but um, so if anyone has suggestions on that I think that that, that would be welcome but you know I think really the main point and, and the thing that sticks with me is that that polar polar science is really important for the audiences general audiences to understand and and to show how polar changes in polar regions really influence us all and that's the message I kind of bring and and polar trek has opened a lot of doors to share that message um, I'll be doing a presentation, a poster presentation at AGU the last Friday before Christmas. So I don't know how many people will be there, but um, hopefully I'll get to talk to some more people about polar science. Um, this picture is from a Skype in the classroom lesson that I did. Um, if you haven't looked at those even to bring into your cl classes, um, these are students from India, and, and I was I've got to talk with students from ten different countries around the class, around the world, and uh, hundreds of kids, and they just were so interested and in, in really wanting to know what climate change is and what the polar regions are like. So that was really a good venue, um, and I suggest looking at Skype, um, and, and I used a PowerPoint presentation through Skype, but that was a nice way uh, for current or future polar trek teachers to reach a wider audience. Um, I think that's it. I, I, I really wanted to focus on the outreach and the lessons I learned because for me that, that's a continuing impact, how much uh, the experience is getting, is getting the attention of other people. Great point, Regina. Thanks for that. I am going to turn it over to Andre to do an introduction to what he's been up to lately and then Jeanette can probably comment after that. Great. Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, excellent. So, um, Team Squirrel here. We had a, a really great group of people. Uh, Corey Williams was the, the PI, and then Jeanette Moore, um, and we had an REU, Victor Zhang, and um, an undergrad going on to her PhD program, Kate Wilsterman, working with us. So we had a, a fun group of people, and it, the, it changed during the four weeks that I was up in Tulik. Here and there, uh, Corey came the first part and then left, and then Jeanette came up and took over as the as our team leader. But uh, we had a really great time. It was uh, one of the neat things I thought was just working with people at all these different academic levels, um, and having the undergrad students was was a lot of fun, and it helped me a lot to see what skills um, my science students coming out of high school really need to have as they go in. To college and beyond, and um, so that I thought was really eye-opening. Um, and then, of course, um, seeing you know the the high-level science being done, the Squirrel Project has been going ongoing for a decade or more, um, and so it's it's got a very long storied history, and um, so that was was really cool. Basically, um, 
when I got there, immediately we needed to go out and catch a bunch of squirrels. So one of the pictures on the on the middle left is loaded up with a big backpack we called the Schlepper, with about 20 traps, um, live traps, to go out and catch squirrels. And the goal was to catch a whole bunch of male squirrels for our phase shift experiment. And um, the idea was to catch the males. That way, we wouldn't interfere with the reproductive cycle of the females. We caught these males, and then they were implanted with a temperature logger, little eye button. So um, they had to go into surgery. Um, um, that was another eye opener. They were implanted with these little um, thermistors, and um, and then we kept them in captivity for I think about two weeks, 10 days to 14 days, um, to make sure that they healed up, and then to to change their circadian rhythm with artificial lights. So we had them in a chamber and uh, shifted their light by about an hour every day. And then after about 12 days, they were you know, completely out of phase. So um, they were waking up just opposite to what a normal squirrel would wake up. So we were kind of messing with their circadian rhythm, giving them an extreme case of jet lag. And then um, at the end of that, we let them go back out into the wild. And the goal was to kind of see, you know, why do these squirrels maintain circadian rhythms in an environment that has 24 hours of daylight in the summer. And is there any uh, adaptive benefit to that? So um, the jury is still out on that question. It's a, it's a long-term question, and we haven't uh, gotten the answers. And, and maybe um, Jeanette can speak to that a little bit more. But it was, it was quite an involved process, and it was great to be part of the team. And I always had plenty of stuff to do. And I was really helped by the by all the people involved to kind of guide me along and show me what needed to be done and how to do it. And I picked up some good skills, uh, especially trapping squirrels. Um, so that was kind of uh, what it was like up in Tulik um, when we were busy doing our research. Um, we can switch to the next slide, maybe. Um, this shows some of the science actually taking place. And one of the big challenges was actually trying to do this work out in the field conditions. Um, sometimes we had nice weather, and other times it was it was fairly tough. When it was really bad, we we had to we couldn't go out because it was be too tough for the squirrels. Um, if it was really cold, because we had to keep them and um, to download the data, they had to be anesthetized. So um, on the really nasty days, we got a day off. But um, still, even on the good days, it was it was challenging uh, working conditions. But um, I was very pleased with, with the whole situation. It was great. Uh, and some really neat data. So in my classes um, this year, I've started a, a unit on animal behavior and physiology that I teach in my Biology 2 class. And this just fit in just great with some of the things that um, I already do. But it added a, a kind of a new element to it that I'm still working on. Um, and this year, I, um, we used, for example, this graph and, and just did some interpreting graphs and, and database questions where students had to kind of figure out what was going on. But currently, I'm, I'm working with Jeanette and Corey on um, I've got a huge database with something like, I don't know, a couple thousand data points um, from one animal. Um, and the idea is to develop an activity using an Excel spreadsheet to kind of have the students um, develop some graphing skills and then analysis skills of a very large data set um, and trying to kind of match the, um, the changes in the animal's body temperature with some of the environmental changes um, such as soil temperature. So that's, an, that's a work in progress right now. But uh, Jeanette and Corey have been great in kind of putting together the data sets for me. And, and we're just going on that in the last couple weeks here. Um, when I got back, one of the big things that I did that really worked out well with the Polar Trek thing was we had an experiential education week that we did this, this year in the fall <clears throat> for the first time. And so I took a group of 10 kids up into the tundra, in the alpine tundra, um, in, a, in the area in Colorado near our school, and looked at tundra ecology and um, kind of made comparisons with, with what we did in Tulik and showed them my slides and, and stuff that we did in Tulip and some of the research that's taking place, not specifically squirrels, but a lot of the um, climate research and anything that was you know, relevant. 
and looking at wildlife and, and comparing adaptations to our tundra to, to the Arctic tundra. So the kids actually got a, a nice chance to be out in the field and see some of these things and, and really experience it. So that was, that was fantastic. I've also integrated into my biology classes. Um, I teach an integrated science class that we're going to do some things <coughs> with. And I've been in a couple of my other um, colleagues' classes um, presenting and just showing them what the whole uh, squirrel research project was about. Um, it fits in well with our IB biology curriculum, so that, that's worked out well and I hope to do some more in some of my other uh, colleagues' classes. Um, I've had a chance to go down and visit our elementary and middle schools, um, just a few classes, but um, trying to tailor lessons um, for those different levels has been good. One of the things that I did um, was put together a book, and let me see if the video works here. I put together a, a book with Shutterfly that um, has a lot of my pictures, and I'm holding it up in the camera. I don't know if you guys can see it. But it's been kind of fun. If you yeah. hit the talk button once and then click it again so we don't get feedback, but I believe your video will show up big for folks right then. And then turn the video back on too. Okay. And hit the talk button. I'm getting some ringing. No. Okay. Um, yeah. I, That's okay. Anyway, I had some problems with the talk button not connecting. Um, okay. But anyway, putting together the book um, has been really helpful when I'm in other classes because I can leave it with them. Kids can thumb through it, or it sounds like I'm going to have to have a read aloud hour in the elementary classrooms, like um, somebody did earlier uh, with the. Anyway. Um, so that's been a nice addition. Um, I built a display that's up on the wall in our school, so anybody walking down the hall can't miss out on on the squirrels. And you know, squirrel science is, is everywhere in the school. Um, so that's been fun. That's a new thing I've just kind of put together very recently. Um, and it's it's basically a lot of the stuff from my journals, but it it's. Um, makes it a little more accessible, I guess, to kids that are they're just hanging out in the hall or walking down the hall or parents that are in the building um, can kind of see it and go, oh, you know, if they're interested, they can check it out. Um, so that's worked out well. Um, some of the other outreach, um, I've got a couple of presentations uh, with the local um, environmental education center here in town. They have a speaker series. So I had to wait until their speaker series starts here in January. Um, but I'm scheduled for a couple of nights um, in, in my community in Aspen and then in the nearby community 30 miles down the road. So um, I'm still trying to put together the presentation and integrate some of the videos that I, um, I built and put together several videos when I was up in the field. And I want to integrate those into the, to the slideshow presentation. So it will be a multimedia with you know, with videos and slides and sounds and other things. So those are a few of the things that I'm up to, um, the main highlights. Um, Perfect. Thanks. And yeah. I'll turn it over to Jeanette to comment a little bit. Uh, Corey Williams is away. He's actually on an airplane right now on the way back to Alaska. It says, let's see, Jeanette says, sorry, I'm unable to contribute through video a talk. Um, I can tell you that the long legged happy guy like Andre was an excellent addition to the team. We're now analyzing 20 years of body temperature data paired with weather data to look at behaviors over time. Polar check has been a very important part of our research. Andre's book is awesome. Thanks, Jeanette. I appreciate you commenting. That's really helpful. And uh, yeah, it's been great to work with your team as well. So at this point, I will turn it over to uh, Russell, I believe. And Russell. Let you have the microphone. All right, nice timing, Sarah. The pasta is just about done, so I'm going to totally multitask here um, at the same time, but we can handle this. I think I can just turn it off and let it sit, perhaps. Um, so, real quick background here. I guess I was the first one out. Everybody may remember that. And uh, I went off to, I'll put my video on here. Mm. There I am. Sorry. 
Um, I went off to Kangaroo Sack, Greenland with Operation Ice Bridge. Those are the NASA guys who fly a P-3 Orion plane, uh, the nose of which is in the center photo you can see in the top there. And Operation Ice Bridge's mission is to uh, fly uh, over, take this P-3 plane loaded with scientific equipment, fly over Greenland and also parts of uh, Antarctica and parts of the Canadian and Alaskan Arctic as well as the Arctic Ocean itself and take ice measurements. They have a whole suite of instruments and on board the plane I won't go into. It has lots of radars and as well as uh, some uh, imaging equipment as well. And this allows them to, among other things, determine the depth and nature of the ice pack all the way down to the, the bedrock, even when it's three kilometers deep in a place like Greenland. And obviously get a time series of data as they fly the exact same routes every single year. And so they can measure how the thickness changes over time. Unlike most of uh, everyone else you guys uh, who went out, I wasn't with a single principal investigator other than the leader of a big team. That was Michael Studinger. Um, but we were with a large team of uh, operators, equipment operators who worked on this plane with me. And uh, all NASA does with this data, I'm moving you guys around, you can see this because I'm turning my pasta off now. Um, and NASA just makes all of this data free for everybody to go get and go access. They make it open in the public domain and then it's used by uh, researchers worldwide to access and, and publish whatever they want to publish or study whatever they want to study. So they're kind of unique that way. Only a few people on the board the plane with me actually ever put their names on papers uh, very often. Again, most of them are just there to help collect data and then they get out of Dodge. So for me, it was all about the scientific instruments on the plane and what they do, how they work, and then also, you know, what then is the end result of the data. And I think uh, real quick in the pictures, let's go around and mention the plane in the front. The uh, right-hand picture is looking right out the window of the plane, upper right, of one of the uh, researchers who's actually sleeping at that moment, um, and the wires from his headset. Then the left picture, upper left, is me in front of uh, a glacial front of the ice cap. So it looks like any other glacier front that you might see, like kind of unlike, you know, like Peggy's and so on. But behind me, of course, the ice goes on for most of a thousand miles, which is kind of cool. Um, the bottom picture in the middle is a, a quick shot down the fuselage of the plane, a bunch of the folks who work on the plane, some of the instruments on the right hand side in the back. Um, and the other two photos are just some scenic shots from outside the plane, icebergs and a beautiful frozen over fjord. On the next slide, next, 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 uh, I'll show you, there we go. Um, I'll show, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk and move you guys around here. I've I got to take about two seconds to drain a big vat of pasta. It's got to be al dente, so hold on one second. I like that it's kind of a Oh, yes. I, I can do show. both. I can do Good. both. Just to show you guys. There it is. I'm going to hold the camera. There it is. There's the pasta in the sink. Sorry, holding the computer upside down. Um, back to the, the, <laughs> the uh, task at hand. There's a schematic picture in the upper right of the plane itself and it shows the, all the equipment on board and where they're located on the outside of the plane. The bottom right picture is actual radar data that shows how deep the ice can be. In this particular screenshot, the ice is around 2,300, 2,400 meters deep. And the bedrock is the very bottom line, as indicated by the red arrow in the, in the label there. And then you can see the other layers of ice that build, build up above that from, some, from one of the radars. And then on the left, upper left, is a Google screenshot of the, uh, one of the most active glaciers in Greenland. That's the Jakobshavn Glacier. But overlaying on that are color-coded images of some of our flight routes over it. And the colors indicate elevation change. And uh, I don't know if you guys can see, I see I have a pointer, but I don't know if you guys have a pointer, but it's going to show you where you can see some changes in, in the ice front. Uh, the lower right hand picture, the lower right hand uh, corner of the bay, if you will, has a change in ice elevation indicating a shrinking of the glacier. And so it's really easily seen by overlaying the, the image. There's the pointer. I don't know how to move the pointer. I don't know if I have moved the pointer, but it doesn't matter. It's right here. <laughs> um, and so, 
And finally, on the bottom left is an image that was published in a worldwide publication, actually, the paper came out, if I'm not mistaken, early in 2014 using primarily ice bridge data, again, where the bedrock is. And that's a picture of Greenland minus all of the ice. Um, and uh, a couple things come from this. First of all is that the center of Greenland is below sea level. And that's indicated kind of in the brown portions, if you will, the, the beige portions there. Second of all, the world's largest canyon runs down the middle of Greenland. It's longer than any other canyon known on the surface of the Earth. And it runs north to south, exiting in the very top northern portion of Greenland. So that was not known until the, this image was produced. And finally, if Greenland ever melted all the ice off uh, the, that country, then uh, you'd end up with the Greenland archipelago where the center would be filled with water and surrounded by lots of high peaks, particularly on the east side. And nobody really knew about that either. So that, 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 that's one example of the use of some of the iceberg data. So I had a wonderful time there and getting to know a whole scat of people that went through on the team. I had a large group, as I said, and there was probably 25, 26 people, something like that all told between those who rotated in and out that were on the plane beside me at one point or another. And that does not include a whole Al Jazeera camera crew, which was four or five people as well. So we were pretty busy. Um, I also met some teachers from Greenland and Denmark as well and, and whatnot. So we had a lot of, lot of great times there. In terms of what, what's happened kind of since then, um, I've done some outreach in terms of presentations with classes my own classes, I did right when I got back. I've also done it with elementary school classes now on three different occasions. Um, and I have lots of networking for that. One is, of course, my, through my own kids, but another way is through the science, the science uh, club that goes around to different elementary schools and do, pre do presentations as well. So I have multiple outlets, and my, my primary audience through all of these outlets are elementary school kids. But I've, I've also talked to some older uh, groups periodically as well. Um, I have more opportunities coming up, both in terms of giving some presentations and discussions with, with uh, other professionals, other teachers in, in my district, as well as my own school. I've already done some of that, actually. And then also with the public at large, i got some coming up as well. So I, I keep talking about this experience kind of endlessly, and it's fun as to I wish I had, again, a nickel for every time when I was in Greenland, you know, talking to my students and whatnot. So I've had a great time kind of living, reliving. In fact, just this last week, weekend during Thanksgiving, I had a little presentation with my family and in-laws you know, in and so on. So well, there's Greenland revisited yet again. And it wasn't just what did I did at Greenland, but they were actually interested in the science as well. So that was, that was a blast. So um, it's been a phenomenal experience. And uh, I, while I spend the time, like everyone else, after the expedition working on you know, promoting the science, promoting the whole Polar Trek thing, inside I'm really worried and anxious to hear what's happening to the future of the program. And so I'm concerned for you guys. And uh, I don't know if I'll be still on the air when you go over what the future holds. But I do want to hear that one way or the other. And I'll sign off for now. Thanks, Russell. That was great. Um, and the uh, Cliff Notes version is Janet and I are working real hard on a proposal, but I'll mention a little more later. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Lauren and Byron. They're our last team, and then we'll just catch everybody up on a few last things and then head out. So Lauren, I will turn it over to you. OK. Hi, everybody. Um, so I was up at Chulik, also at the same time as Regina, as a part of sort of the same collaborative project, working with um, Byron Crump primarily, and also getting to see though what Rose and George were up to as well. Uh, so Byron's project is specifically looking at microbial changes in Arctic freshwater. So a lot of our daily task was to go out and collect different samples from the Tulik watershed or from different streams or lakes in the area so that we could see um, and, and filter all of those water samples to collect the microbes so that ultimately we could take those little Sterevex filters back to the lab and extract the DNA, which is the filtering shown in the upper two pictures, 
and the extraction of the DNA is shown in the lower left. Um, and that we would extract the DNA, and then that DNA would be uh, sent back to Oregon State, where they would do um, some PCR reactions to amplify the DNA and make more copies of it so that they could sequence uh, the different uh, microbes and see who was actually there. So this is kind of a, a project to figure out what microbes are present in these different bodies of water through the different seasons and in the different bodies of water to compare, you know, how does the soil water compare to uh, the water in the streams versus the water in the lake and see kind of what the patterns are. So that's, that's an, a big idea of what we were doing. And also the bottom right picture is a picture of me at a thermokarst, which is one of the sort of bigger changes physical changes in the landscape that uh, has been documented in this area. So that is where they've seen these sort of slumps, big landslides of the, the land sort of slipping away as the permafrost melts. And they're trying to figure out what the impact is on the watershed and um, both the microbes and how the sunlight is interacting with the, the carbon and other nutrients that are released due to this permafrost melt and int introduction into um, the watershed. So that was another sort of exciting thing. It was a very hands-on project. Um, really enjoyed working with Byron and Sarah and getting to know them and getting to know kind of more about this science and how to research things you can't see and, and all of that. Um, so next slide. So then how I've brought it back to St. Mary's Academy in my classroom and, and just back from the Arctic in general, um, I have done a classroom presentation at a fourth and fifth grade classroom down at our lower school. And I did that before I left. And so those students were kind of following along, some of them, not all of them, but uh, over the summer that was a little, a little tricky and trying to get some of my high school students to follow along. I do know some of them did, they just didn't comment, but I heard from them later on now that they definitely were there. Um, and I have scheduled a lower school, I have Friday assemblies for the whole uh, lower school that I will be presenting at and kind of trying to take this down to a pretty basic level for them coming up in January. Um, I brought it back in my classroom. I, I had it today in my classroom. We, we were doing a gel electrophoresis experiment and we talked about the different uses of gel electrophoresis and their applications um, bringing up how that's used in the arctic and then we were using it to look at um, if this cancer gene was present in different family members we also did a dna extraction um, just of a a banana but nevertheless talked about the techniques and how it was similar and analogous to what we were doing up in the arctic and then um, I've had an article published in the Loretto Earth Network, which is the Sisters of Loretto run my school, and they wanted to do a feature to send out um, to people in their community about the expedition. And then I also have um, a Colorado College alumni profile coming out in an upcoming edition where they wanted kind of an article about the experience and how it connected to both college and after college and what um, sort of different skills I learned from it and what adventures I got into. And then coming up next semester in my new classes, the next semester of AP Environmental Science and Biology 2, I'll be doing a lot more in terms of lessons with roles, microbes and ecosystems, um, talking about not only their role in nutrient cycling, but also just some other roles in general and also trying to bring in the, the sunlight piece um, as a, another thing. I might, I haven't decided yet, but I might have them read at least portions of Rose's article um, to see kind of what their reactions are. And, and then in biology too, also looking at um, a lot more with bacteria and kind of the different genes that we, the 16 are, uh, I might have just flubbed that, <laughs> the different genes and bacterial roles again and um, sort of what this ecosystem is like. So 
uh, lots of different things going on, working on kind of different lessons. I think there'll be more for next semester's classes versus this semester. But nevertheless, trying to stay busy. Thanks, Lauren. And uh, Byron, if you want to make a comment. OK, well, I'll just make a quick comment. Um, can you hear me OK? Yeah, it was a pleasure working Sounds with great. Lauren in the, up in the Arctic and with Regina. Um, we had a very good time uh, uh, visiting uh, a lot of different lakes and streams and talking about thermocarsts and talking about microbes and the role they play in Arctic ecosystems. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with Lauren, maybe going to visit her class. I think that's the next thing we're going to be talking about. That's it. Great, thanks. That's a, a pretty good segue into our next few slides. Um, there were some alumni in the chat box saying they didn't need to comment out loud, but that things sounded great. Um, so I'll leave it at that. But we did invite alumni that were partner teachers and folks who were at orientation to uh, participate and just check back in with people. So um, I feel like I should turn on my video and say hello to all of you as well. So I'm down here. Hi. Um, Let's see, I pass through the slides here. As a reminder, we have more folks out in the field right now. So these are our Antarctic teachers. Jillian at the top has already headed out and come back. Um, and then right below her is Dominique, who's yet to go. She's headed out in March, so it'll be a while. But in the meantime, Armando's headed the South Pole. Lucy, Yamini, Alex, and Brian are all out in the field right now. Uh, just to keep up with those guys, there's a Polar Connect event with Lucy on Friday of next week. So um, participate in that if you can. It'll be a great one. She's been out in the dry valleys for weeks on end, so she'll be back at McMurdo to talk about it. We have Polar Connect plans with Yamini, at least three events, uh, one for elementary, one for high school, one for a different group. And then there are Facebook pages out there like crazy. Dominique has a great one. Yamini's team has put one together. And then Alex has a Facebook that uh, is sort of run by Waddell Seals. It's kind of cool. And then um, the Ice Cube project that Armando is participating in in South Pole will have webinars that we are assisting with, but they have them all over the world, which is pretty cool, or in different languages for folks all over the world. As a follow-up on a few things, and Byron made a great sort of segue into travel requests for sure. But remember that in the future, as an alumni, you'll be getting a survey at the end of the school year. We've talked to all of you about different evaluation tools, which are crucial for things like writing proposals in the future. Uh, so those will be coming out to you. Your expedition pages are always available to you. So even though you are back from the field, you can absolutely be documenting different outreach events if you want to, or if you visit your research team, or the team comes to you. You can continue to utilize it for different science um, uh, components in your work. Some of our alumni have participated in other Arctic or Antarctic projects and used their blogs for that. So um, Betsy Wilkening is a great example of that, or Bill Schmoker, who talked to us about photos. So you can definitely keep using the website as much as you need. So let us know if you need any help with that. Of course, there's our social networking tools. The Twitter account and Facebook pages are always there, as well as um, the Association for Polar Early Career Scientists have a Facebook page, and they love to connect with educators, as Emily was saying at the beginning, as well as the Polar Educators International Facebook page. So for uh, travel requests, if you are interested in visiting your team to analyze data or see what's happening as a follow-up, uh, let us know and send in a travel um, assistance request. Well, the form is available in your uh, manual online, but you can ask for it as well. And so we really encourage people getting back together, especially researchers, heading out to where the teachers are and seeing where that information has now transferred to. Uh, Janet, I'll let, you can let me know if I missed anything there. But then the future of Polar Trek, we are proposing or, or 
answering a request for proposals that is due in January. So Janet and I have a fun-filled Christmas vacation coming, uh, full of writing and getting reports together. We've actually even used um, some of the science reports that you all have written that are being turned in as part of a tool to say what impact the program has had and why it should continue. Which that leads me to um, a couple of things. If folks are still working on requirements, um, if I had my druthers of what you work on, those public science reports are crucial. So please send those in and, and get those uploaded as quick as you can. Um, they're really helpful to us. A lot of folks will be um, stymied by the photo documentation to let us know if you need help with that. Lots of you still have your gear, uh, computers and that kind of thing, so let us know when you are ready to send those back. Um, and just one or two of you still have travel paperwork that is due to Arcus for any reimbursements. That will expire at some point, so you've got to get those receipts and information into us. Uh, let me see. I'm going to leave it at that. See if Janet has any other comments. Do you want to comment, Janet? Are you available? Hi. I was just typing away. Um, I just wanted to say we'll be doing a calendar again um, sometime this year. So the sooner Arctic people can get their stuff in, the, the more likely your stuff will show up in this year's calendar. We try to wait till um, all the expeditions are done. But anyway, um, just like Sarah said, the public reports are really key for us in, um, in writing this proposal. Or if you have anything that you think would be useful for a proposal, um, please just send it to us and, and we'll see if we can use it. Absolutely. A couple of alumni have sent along um, science articles or education research that's been really helpful. So anything you guys think of that would be helpful, um, we have a lot of anecdotal, but if there is anything um, report-wise or, or science paper or education research that really helps. So thanks so much to our whole team that's been helping us get it together. Is there any other questions or comments from folks? I will sort of let the microphone be back open if anybody wants to put their hand up or type away or just start talking about us know if there's anything. Go ahead, Russell. I'll just go with the audio here um, real quick since we're about to run off the swim lessons here. But uh, I just want to say, you know, when I it's so cool to read everybody. I've been reading a lot of people's journal entries, even in their, you know, after the fact, and also to hear back from people having come back. And so it's cool to think about the perspective of we met you. I met you guys all before we did any of this. Now I hear back from all you guys after you've done this, and. There's no doubt in my mind why Sarah and Janet picked all of you guys. It's just so obvious how awesome you guys are. And uh, I'm just really, really amazed at how, how incredible you guys are in terms of the work you did before and also afterwards. Uh, I think at Emily's, and she could probably open a polar trek you know, shop based on all the stuff she made based on the expedition. So that is just so pretty, so amazingly cool. That's it. Thanks, Russell. It's definitely true. All right. Looks like people are just kind of like uh, sharing general um, cheers to people in the chat box, great presentations, stuff like that. And at this point, I think I'll uh, let you all have the rest of your evening. I know it's late over on the East Coast, and it's time for dinner here in Alaska. So. Um, let us know if there's anything we can do for you when you're doing your outreach and uh, whatever activity it might be. Send us a quick email. They're the favorite ones that we get all day long, and we could probably um, help network you with other people too. So anything you're thinking about, you send over to us. It would be great to hear from you anytime. And I will be archiving the event in just a little bit, maybe the next few days, and I'll send you all the link, and you could send off to any other research teams that needed to uh, to get a hold of it. So thanks so much, and have a great rest of your evening. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you.